All right. Are there uh, people maybe walked in late need a worksheet? topic, torsional loads in our members. And so the torsion we'll kind of cover today, probably bleed into Thursday. That torsion material will be the last material that will be included in our midterm, which is a week from today. The next Tuesday is our midterm. So we're not having a thermal expansion material in midterm? So I'm going to cover the uh, thermal expansion example today. Uh, to start off to wrap up chapter four. Um, so that material could be on there. Yep. But yeah, so the midterm will cover sort of stress strain, material properties, axial loads. Uh, the one important distinction I guess I'll go ahead and, and make as far as axial, if you look at the topics of the axial chapter and then the torsional chapter, they follow pretty much the same structure that we start off with determinate, determinate axial loads and then indeterminate axial loads where you have to use the force or stiffness method. Torsional chapter is the same way. The torsional chapter we're going to cover just the determinate part. So you solve it if you've got an indeterminate torsional system exactly the same way you would for a axial, but the indeterminate torsional problems will not be on the midterm. And, uh, I mean, I'll talk more on Thursday about the midterm, but, you know, in general, uh, I posted a sample exam, covers like the, the basic topics, the uh, learning objectives we have for each unit certainly is a good starting point. Examples in class is a good starting point. I posted additional problems if you want to look at those. And then I posted a sample exam. So all those are sort of good practice. I'm not uh, putting the expectation out there that you need to work all those to be prepared. Um, I just, I've had some students ask, hey, do you have this? Do you have this? Have these? So I try to make a lot of material available. Um, but, um, you know, we all have limited time. So that's all just sort of good material to look at, to review, um, and then pick and choose which problems you need to work on and focus on your study. Any burning questions on that before we jump into materials? Yeah? How many questions are going to be on the exam? Uh, so I write a new exam every time. I've not written it yet, so I don't exactly know. Uh, if you look at the uh, example I posted, I think I've got it here. Yeah. So the example I posted, um, yeah, this one has three multiple choice questions. Uh, then there's kind of a workout problem for material properties, workout problem for axial load, and a sort of workout problem for torsion. Um, this is longer than you would expect, so that my intent with this practice exam is let's give you a problem for each of the, um, the material topics that we've covered, so you can practice those. But this exam is longer, and so typically uh, I have to pick and choose a little bit. And so sometimes you might have an exam that uh, you've got a long workout problem for axial, and so then maybe you just have some short answer about torsion and some of the other stuff. Or you might have the opposite. You might have just some shorter uh, problems with axial and then a longer workout problem for torsion, you know, that sort of thing. So. Uh, it varies, but I, my, my general approach is I write the exam, I take the exam, I time myself, and then I multiply by three um, and make sure that you've got that for uh, time duration. Um, 
So that's kind of my general approach. So it sort of varies as far as the total number of problems. But I think it's usually fair. Okay. Doo -doo -doo. So schedule. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. So let me jump back into where we were last week. So we covered everything except for thermal expansion. So let's go ahead and look at that. So thermal expansion is just how do materials behave due to changes in temperature. And so generally what what have people observed in practice or what do people understand in, in practice? Uh, yeah. So a real common one like in chemistry or different things, you know, you've got a gas and then it heats up and takes a much more volume. You know, it's it's a smaller expansion with like solid state steel, but the same phenomenon happens that if it heats up from zero degrees to hundred degrees, those molecules that make up the steel member are going to expand a little bit. So they're going to get a little bit longer. Or if it gets colder, they're going to contract. And so it's going to get a little bit shorter. So uh, that's just kind of a general molecular property for all materials. And we have an expression here to evaluate the amount of deformation that we have with our members. And so that deformation, that longitudinal expansion or contraction is equal to this term alpha times the change in temperature delta T times the length of the member. So alpha is just a linear coefficient of thermal expansion. So if you look up in your material charts where you've got certain grade material, you've got all this information, you scroll over uh, to the last column, coefficient of thermal expansion. So we've got that just a material property associated with um, all materials. So you can look that up, and the units for the alpha term is just per degree. And so for the English unit system, per degree Fahrenheit, the metric system, per degree Celsius. So you multiply a change in temperature degrees by alpha per degree. <clears throat> degrees cancel out, and so the units you have are just your unit of length. The sign convention here is the same as we've always used. If the temperature increases, your delta T is positive, so the expansion of your material is going to lengthen. It's going to be positive versus if your delta T is, uh, gets colder, so that delta T is going to be negative, then your material is going to contract, that delta T is going to be negative. So, relatively straightforward for these problems, as far as that concept, but these problems are often sort of tied in to a system like this that has two main components. So what we have here, we've got just a series of three members that spans from a support on the left to a support on the right. And the concept with all of these is that these are installed at a given temperature. In this case, that given temperature is 12 degrees Celsius. And so we install these members and we make it snug tight so that it just sort of fits just to touch the left support and just to touch the right support. And it's installed in place. And so in that initial installation, it's just kind of installed and there's no loads applied. So if we were initially to do a you know, cross section through our member, look for resultant forces, there's no normal force because the length of the member just fits perfectly right there. Then what happens is we get thermal expansion. So our materials want to expand. In this case, they're getting uh, it's getting warmer, so they're wanting to expand and expand outwards. But we've got the support on the left and the right. So the supports on the left and the right can find that expansion, and so that 
introduces a normal force into our members. <coughs> So, does anyone have any ideas on how we could solve, in this case it says, calculate the normal forces that result from the temperature change. So we're wanting to determine that normal force. Do we have any ideas on how we could approach this? Yeah. Uh, calculate the strain from the temperature, or what it would be if there weren't the constraint, <laughs> and then the normal force would be Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's, that's, that's uh, the exact approach I would take. And so in this sort of scenario, let's just go ahead and draw our complete free body diagram. Let's call this uh, point A, B, C, D. Yeah, so we've got these reactions that are going to develop there. And because we know our, our materials are going to want to expand, but they're confined, that those reactions are going to be compressive in nature. So that's why I observed that and showed the direction of AX and DX um, as compression. So we could approach this kind of like the force method or stiffness method. And so I think the method uh, you described was a little bit like the force method, where for the force method, we could just sort of say, let's ignore for a minute that constraint on the left side, and let's just sketch out what our materials are going to do based on that change in temperature. And so based on that change in temperature, This material from C to D, it's going to want to get a little bit longer, right? So we're going to have just a little delta T right there. That's our 100 millimeters that we started with. Then the same phenomenon is going to happen for the brass member in the middle that we're going to have our 200 millimeters that it started with, but it's going to have a little bit of expansion as well. And then our last material here, it's going to have its start 300 millimeters, and it's going to expand some as well. And so the total expansion we're going to have is going to be the sum of each three of those. Does that sort of make sense? That member CD is going to get a little bit longer, member BC is going to get a little bit longer, member AB is going to get a little bit longer, so that delta T total is going to be uh, uh, the sum from a to D, and the, uh, the equation we have is that alpha delta T times the length. <clears throat> the normal forces that are going to develop I draw this deformed element that has some initial delta T, and that this is the, the sum delta T that I'm trying to illustrate here, that all of them together, that we're going to have normal forces that develop and what can we infer about the amount of deformation due to that normal force? Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> yeah. It should be the same as the thermal expansion, just <laughs> exactly. It's got to be the exact same magnitude, just in the opposite direction, as the thermal expansion. So this, we're going going to have a, you know, each one of these is going to have a, you know, slight delta normal force, delta normal force, delta normal force due to that applied axial load. And so we're going to have a summation of that normal force, which is summation from A to D of NL over AE. So the quantity of this has to be equal to that because we're constrained in that dimension from A to Z. If we look at our variables, alpha is coefficient of thermal expansion. That's known because we know the materials. Our delta T, we're given 12 degrees to 18 degrees. Lengths of each member are given. So we can solve directly for delta T. It's going to have a numeric value you can solve for. We look at the second equation, length A and E, those are all known, so the only variable we have is normal force. How does the normal force vary over the length of that member? We have a normal force from A to B that's different than the normal force in B to C. It's constant. Why? Yeah. I mean, if we look at from our global statics, we know that summation of forces in the x has to be equal to zero. The only forces in the x we have are ax and dx. So we can write that equation that ax minus dx, because I drew one to the left, one to the right, is equal to zero. So AX is equal to DX. So those reactions are the same. And so these reactions here, you know, I can just show AX, AX there. Anywhere you section your member and draw your free body diagram, that resultant normal is going to be equal to AX in each section. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious why we are representing the expansion as like a horizontal as I'm just figuring that uh, I would I would expect the area of the cross section to be acting in the same changing. It's just kind of weird to express it as having grown because it technically can't. Is that I guess going to be a problem in the future? Like is should I always see the beam as an expansion? outward or uh, like along the uh, normal force or good question so if you remember back to chapter three when we talked about the Poisson ratio I didn't bring my my stretchy band today I should have um, but the Poisson ratio was observing that when we've got a member and it undergoes some change in length and let's say we've got a contraction going on that we can observe that the cross section does get thicker. And so generally speaking with any deformation in the longitudinal direction, we're going to have a corresponding change in dimension in the transverse direction. And so they're related, they're related via the Poisson ratio. I see, oh, okay, okay, so they're both equivalent. In so, well, so, well, so they both are going to change. And so we could calculate the thermal expansion in diameter for these as well. But what's generally true for 
systems that we design is that generally speaking, the length of our member is going to be much, much bigger than the cross-section dimension of our member. And so the amount of expansion we're going to get lengthwise is much bigger than the amount we're going to get cross-section-wise. But the cross-section will happen as well. Other questions? Okay. So let's just go ahead and uh, jump in here and plug some numbers. So if we look at our delta t is going to be equal to the summation from a to d of alpha delta t l. What we get that delta t is a constant. So I'm going to go ahead and factor that out to the front. So our delta t is 6 degrees Celsius. So then let's multiply that by alpha times L for each of our sections. So if we make this a little bit smaller, you can see for each of our sections, we're given the alpha up there, the alpha of steel, alpha of brass, alpha of copper. So we've got those materials. So the first alpha, 12 times 10 to the negative 6 that's per degree C. Then the length of that member is 300 millimeters plus alpha of brass, 21 times 10 to the negative 6 per degree C times its length, 200 millimeters plus alpha of copper, 17 times 10 to the negative 6 per degree C times 100 millimeters. So we plug those values in and we get an expansion of 0 0.057 millimeters. So, uh, we stated before that the, the normal force is constant in each section of our member. So that normal force is equal to AX you'll have a preference on if I express it as N or as AX in the equation. Okay, so our delta due to normal force is just that summation from A to D of NL over AE. So if we look at this equation, normal force is constant, length AE, those all vary. So I'll go ahead and factor out the normal force, which is constant, and then put the rest in parentheses. The normal force is constant. That's multiplied by the length of the first member, 300 millimeters over. Cross-section is given in the figure above. It's 200 millimeters squared, and then our module plasticity is 200 gigapascals, which corresponds to 200 kilonewtons per square millimeter, plus next section of our member, 200 millimeters over its cross-sectional area, 450. 50 millimeters squared times its modulus of 100 gigapascals, which is 100 kilonewtons 
per square millimeter plus our last section 100 millimeters over cross section of 515 square millimeters times a modulus of 120 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. So we can evaluate that expression in the uh, parentheses. And so our normal force times the quantity 0 0.01356. And the units there is millimeters per kilonewton. So then we can equate this value with our delta T and solve for our N. So delta N equals delta T, which is 0 0.057 millimeters N times 0 0.01356 millimeters per kilonewton. And is equal to yep. mine got cut off on my solution there. So what does that work out to be? Uh, four point two kilonewtons. Four point two zero. Uh, four point two zero two. Yeah. Zero three three. Yeah. So four point two zero kilonewtons. Um, Sign there is positive because I had drawn it in compression. That positive just means that the sign convention I had chosen was correct. So that's 4.20 kilonewtons in compression. Questions? So these are, um, I think you've got an example on the homework, relatively similar. I think the homework just has a, a gap in the middle, so slight variations. But generally speaking, these are straightforward in that you start off with no normal force, you've got expansion or contraction, and so then the normal force that develops is constant throughout typically, and it's just due to that coefficient thermal expansion. So that topic sort of wraps up chapter four as far as axial, and so they're all looking at different expressions um, with that fundamental deformation that the normal force is equal to, or the deformation of the longitudinal direction is equal to N times L over A times Z. Yeah? So in compression, you have to, in order to expand, you have to find space in order to take the size of the outside force applied to it. If yep. the force gets colder, yep. then in order to stay the same, would there be another tension? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And, you know, I guess when we design our systems, we have to think of these scenarios in that, you know, we often sort of look at it like, oh, what are the design loads, design loads, this or that. But our systems are going to operate in whatever space they're going to operate in. And sometimes even if you've got your thing inside a building, then we think, oh, that's a confined temperature. Like we saw the ice storm, you lose power, you know, like people's houses get down to 30 degrees. Like you can get some serious... Uh, thermal expansion inside. And so you want your system still to be able to withstand that. And so whatever fixture you have on A and D needs to be able to apply both a compression and a tension connection because both are realistic. Yeah. So during the ice storm on the pipes burst, if they people say they leave their water running, is that so that there's not as much compression of the metal because the water is going to go? 
I don't think it has to do with compression. Correct me if I'm wrong, if someone else knows, but I think that's just um, if you have stationary water, then it can start to freeze solid. Oh, but so if you, water itself, water. Yeah, so the water itself is freezing inside the pipe, and then because ice expands, then that frozen water bursts the pipe. And so if you keep the water flowing, it uh, minimize or it reduces, increases the time that it would take for that water to freeze. Okay. Water still could freeze if it's flowing, but it just would take much longer than if it's stationary. Okay. Well, let's check the pipes to make sure we go with it. Sorry, yep, nice. yep, nice. yeah. So um, if you apply a tension to like a beam, does that cool it down? Uh, not really. No. What? What makes you think it would? Because when you compress it, you get hotter, right? How that works? Am I describing? I mean, in the idea that uh, friction causes heat. You know, if you were to compress something to such a degree that you actually had molecular friction between the molecules occurring, you could get heat, but that would have to be such a extreme amount of compression, you probably would observe some other type of failure before you really observed an observable change in temperature. So in practice, I don't think we do notice a change in temperature just from tension or compression. But your comment about um, you know, introducing normal force or, or tension force, you know, this is a true phenomenon and a common place where you've probably driven over it even if you don't recognize it is on bridges. You know, bridges like you're driving and at, you've got a, a bridge beam that's spanning from support on the left to support on the right and it's outside. It's going to go from negative 30 degrees to 120 degrees, lots of expansion. And if we didn't allow thermal gaps to allow for that expansion and contraction, then what we would do is we'd be introducing either compression or tension into our members, which is generally not designed for. And so the practice is that we have these gaps in the pavement on either end that allow for that natural expansion and contraction of our member without introducing either normal or tension or compression or tension forces. Okay. So our new topic, torsion. Roll up here. So our learning objectives for this chapter, we've got two main types of problems. We're going to be dealing with torsion problems and angle of twist problems. So why don't you be able to define both torsion and angle of twist. Something unique to this chapter is that, generally speaking, throughout chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, the resultant stresses that we've looked at have been uniform. The resultant stresses we give with torsion are not uniform. And so I want you to be able to sketch how the shear stress varies across the cross section. Then we're going to calculate what those shear stresses are due to an applied torsion. And lastly, apply the relationship of uh, between twist and torsion to calculate the change in angle along the membrane. So, uh, what are some scenarios where we get torsion? I know we've got a lot of mechanical engineers in the room. So, what's a mechanical application where where we get torsion? Yeah. Axles, yeah, that's a classic one, right? So it could be your bike, it could be your car, it could be your train, whatever it is. But you've got some, some shaft, and 
and generally we're applying power to it to turn it and it's got you know wheels or whatever on the other side that's providing some resistance and so that shaft where you're uh, applying the power and have some resistance twists that shaft and so that's all it is is just torsion twisting of that longitudinal member what happens to the cross section here when I apply that twist It deforms, and specifically, the what is starts out as a rectangle becomes like a parallelogram, right? So those angles that initially are 90 degrees are deformed, so they're not 90. Yes? So do the vertical lines stay straight up and down, but then the longitudinal lines, they kind of curve around? Correct. Yeah, so these these vertical slices, or vertical discs that we have, they stay where they are because our member's not getting longer, not getting shorter. So the relative position along the longitudinal axis for those stays the same. We just have that twist. And so these longitudinal lines are what we get that angle. And if you remember back from chapter one when we started talking about different types of Stresses, shear stresses were those ones where we have what starts out in our cross section of 90 degree angles and it distorts the cross section so that we don't have 90 degree angles. That is what shear is. And so torsion is kind of interesting in that, you know, it's this twist of our member. But if we slice through our member and look at what these resultant stresses are on this face, all that we have are shear stresses. So there's no longitudinal normal force, it's just shear stresses that develop from torsion. So um, I went ahead and included <coughs> this here, the beginning of the torsion sheets, which this is basically your, your cheat sheet. This has everything you need to know to solve all your torsion problems. It's got your equations there for, we use the tau subscript for shear stress. And so that has your equations for your uh, shear stresses on your cross section. And then our equation for angle twist that we have here, uh, it's got that, it's got your definitions, etc. So everything you need is right there. Um, for solving these problems. And so I wanted to present this here first just because I think for whatever reason torsion often can seem a little more confusing or challenging and in reality these problems are really straightforward um, and just break down to applying those, those two equations um, in various scenarios. So it's not any more complicated than normal force. The only distinction that's different really between this as far as complexity is just that the shear stresses vary versus being constant and uniform. So that's the only distinction that's a little bit trickier. So um, if we want to look at, well, how does this actually develop? Um, so you've got your figures here that just sort of illustrate that sort of twisting that I referred to. And you've got your figure there that just sort of illustrates, you know, that distortion of the cross section that right, whoops, my red, that this angle right there, that's our shear strain gamma that we looked at back in chapter one. So I've included the notes here, uh, the basic deformation to, or derivation to get from what we know to the equations that we apply. I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, explaining the derivation, but more or less the process we go through is that we look 
at you know, this line dB that deforms or that moves as we apply this twisting that this point B here moves from where it is to point D and then we just look at how we can define it in two senses. We can define that length dB relative to the longitudinal axis and so that's using that gamma that shear strain to define that length. Or we can look relative to our cross section, looking up to a point that then rotates over and define it, and that would be this, this D phi angle. That angle there is that D phi. And for all of these, we use small angle approximations, which the important thing, if you, you've probably been using some small angle approximations in your homework, but it just means that whenever you're looking at angles that are small, you don't really need to worry about trig. That the length of an arc, which that element BD is an arc, that uh, the length of an arc is just equal to the radius times the angle. And you want to sort of look, this is kind of that small angle approximation that when you start to get small angles, the difference between um, your, your sine, your tangent, and the angle <coughs> itself become insignificant. And so when we are looking at those small angles, we don't need to do the extra work to worry about sort of sine, cosine, anything like that. We can just treat it as the angle and we won't notice any numerical difference. So that's where this all starts, is just kind of two definitions, uh, radius times uh, the angle, for that element BD, we equate them, and then we sort of more or less rearrange terms and get to our equation down here that we end up applying, which we've got two forms for shear stress. Either the torsion, the internal resultant torsion T times C over J, that's the max shear stress, or the shear stress at any location is T rho over J. The distinction between these variables is down here that rho is an arbitrary radius of any point radiating out from the center of our cross section, and C is just the max radius to the outer edge. If we look at how the shear stresses vary on that cross section, it's, it's illustrated here that it varies linearly going from zero directly at the center of our cross section to a max value at that outer edge. Question, yeah? Is that why we're so interested in Tubular torsions, because you get more like torsion radius and then So it, we have a very clean relationship with circular cross sections for torsion scenarios. They're very efficient and it's very straightforward to analyze what the stresses are. If we've got a rectangular cross section and we apply a twist we get uh, shear stresses, but we also get some warping of the cross section where the cross section initially starts as you know, square or rectangular, but then due to the warping, it distorts and it's not square or rectangular. And so there's two components for non-circular uh, cross sections that you've got a shear stress component stress and a warping component stress that just makes it more complicated. Uh, so in scenarios like automobiles where you've got shaft and you're uh, getting torsion, 
pure torsion elements like that, we pretty much always use just circular cross sections because they're efficient, they're strong, um, and easy to analyze. So, uh, if we think a little bit more about this uh, shear stress as it varies, we can, shear stress is going to be a function of the shear strain, right? And you can see that shear strain develop when you twist it, which is just going to be the severity of that line. And if I were to be able to section this member and uh, pull out a smaller inner diameter, the relative strain, this angle, is greatest on the surface. <clears throat> Closer towards the middle, it's less severe. Let's see here, I think I added a... That... You know, this, this distance here, as we look at it radiate, radiates out from the center, that distance is going to keep getting greater and greater and greater until we get to a max distance at that surface. And that distance that you get from the twisting is directly proportional to the shear stress. And so the shear stress is just very linearly from zero at the center to max value at the outer edge. Since we typically are uh, concerned with comparing a max stress to allowable stress, we generally are just applying this, this max formula because that's the critical one. We want to make sure that that doesn't exceed what's allowable. So that internal resultant torsion T C is just the radius to the outer edge of our cross-section, and then J. So J is a new property. It's known as the polar moment of inertia, and it uh, relates the resistance of your cross-section to twist. So it's kind of analogous if you have done uh, some beam analysis. The moment of inertia is the resi resistance of your beam to bend, J is the polar moment of inertia. It's just the resistance of your member to twist. I'm just mm -hmm. curious if you always get warping, no matter if, as long as something is rotating uh, along. Like, you don't get warping with circular cross sections. Okay, so like if it was like in the vacuum space and there's just a tube spinning, you don't get warping. Well, you don't get warping on Earth if it's circular. Okay. So I get warping if it's a non-circular cross-section. Like here, oh, I've got here, I've got a rectangle. I, I apply torsion to it. I get warping of the cross-section. But circular cross-section here on Earth or in space, there's no warping that occurs. It's just a straight shear stress. You don't see like itself. because the torsion force is going to be slightly larger at the extreme. You don't see like I guess internal uh, shear. Nothing. It just it's fine. Just nothing weird happens with it at all. Uh, so warping, I guess, uh, specifically is a term that's referring to changes in the cross-sectional geometry nice. under load. And the cross-sectional geometry starts as a perfect circle and may, it maintains a perfect circle under load. And so there's no change in that cross-section versus your cross-section that's non-circular starts out with nice perpendicular angles and you know square cross section and then if you were to take a slice through here and look at it um, you know you can kind of maybe visualize it a little bit there uh, you actually get changes in that cross section where your yeah, your st angles that started out as 90 degrees are not quite 90 degrees they get some some warping and then of the that and so uh, you know the majority we want to talk about this. Uh, generally speaking, like you're never uh, designing systems that the main force you're dealing with is a torsion. You're pretty much always selecting a circular cross section. 
Um, there are scenarios where you have non-circular cross-sections that do experience torsion. So a common one like that is like in buildings, if you've got a beam on the edge of your building that has only load on one side um, of the beam, then because it's load just on one side, it wants to twist the beam that way. And so you can get torsion on your perimeter beams and buildings, and typically your cross-section of beams and buildings are rectangular, not circular. Um, so there are scenarios where you have torsion of those shapes, um, but where torsion is the dominant load, you pretty much always are selecting circular cross-sections. And so these equations we're going to look at are perfectly applicable. Okay, so you know that gets us to those uh, equations. This is the same um, cheat sheet I showed earlier, and so that new value j, the polar moment of inertia, we've got our equations here. That if we have a solid shaft, just meaning that it's a solid circle, the equation to calculate j is pi over two times c raised to the power of four. C is the radius of that cross section. And if you have a hollow shaft, then we have that second equation that is pi over 2 times c outer to the fourth minus c inner to the fourth. So let's look at our sign convention and then we'll jump into an example and take a break. So our sign convention is analogous to our, uh, our normal force scenario. That our normal force scenario, the sign convention is it's positive if it points away from the cross section. And so we were talking about longitudinal forces for normal force that pointed away. For torsion, it's a twisting moment, and so you're always using the right-hand rule. And so if you've got a resultant force where that right thumb is pointing away from the cross-section, that's what we're going to call a positive torsion. If the twisting is in the opposite way, where your right thumb is pointing towards the cross-section, that we're going to call it negative twisting. So, and then uh, the sign convention for angle of twist, that phi, is the same. That if you apply a positive torsion, the direction of your fingers, that is positive phi. So, should be relatively straightforward there. The basic approach to solve the first types of problems we'll have for this. First types of problems are looking at shear stress. And so generally speaking, we're looking at well, what's the max shear stress? So we need to apply this equation. In order to do that, C is just your cross-sectional radius. J is polar moment of inertia. We can calculate those directly from the cross-section that's given. So we need to solve for T, that internal torsional um, resultant force. So calculate that internal loading. And it's analogous to the normal force that when we did that normal force, often when you've got complex loading, the normal force could vary along the length of your member. And so we solve for that by just taking section between the first part of your beam, AB, solving for the internal resultant, then sectioning between the next sec section of your member, solving for the internal resultant. The same basic procedure to determine that internal loading and then we'll get the shear stress. Okay, so first example here. Let's go ahead and set this up and then we can, we can work on it and we'll take a break and dig into the solution. So here we've got this shaft from A, B, C, D. It's got a series of gears on it, so you can imagine these gears are attached to um, 
different drives, and uh, they're transferring certain torques or torsions to that shaft PD. So we want to determine what is the maximum shear stress in that assembly from A to D. <clears throat> We're given the, the shaft diameter is 50 millimeters, so from that we can calculate C and calculate J. So <clears throat> shear stress max, the equation we're going to apply, TC over J. So first question, that internal resultant T, looking at the loading of our shaft, do we think it's going to vary or do we think it's going to be constant? Yeah, it's going to vary. That's a good observation. So the approach we're going to need to take is first, we're going to need to section our member between A and B, solve for the internal result in A and B. Then section our member between B and C, draw either the left or the right half, solve for the internal result in. And then same thing between C and D so that we'll figure out what that internal resultant T is in each section of the shaft. We'll take the largest of those T's to plug into this equation then to calculate the max shear stress. So I'll write that approach down <clears throat> and then you can work. So, section each uh, region of our member, draw free body diagram, and solve for internal resultant T. Apply the equation tau max equals TC over J using largest resultant. So that's the basic approach. Let's go ahead. Uh, it's 11.03. Let's come back at 11.10. You can kind of take a break if you need it, work on it. We'll look at the solution. Jump in here. Did anyone start to uh, solve for the internal resultants? Oops. This is. What is this guy doing? Oh, here we go. There we go. He's back. Okay. Uh, did anyone solve for the internal resultants? T? No? Break time. All right. Well, should I give you a few more minutes? Yeah. Two more minutes of break. So here, I'll give you a few more minutes. I'll do I'll do one thing that I think can help if if you're struggling. Yeah. Whoops. Uh, and that is, you know, it's a pretty picture in isometric, but hard to redraw, right? So uh, drawing in 2D is much easier to set the problem up, I think. And so. What I like to do is just establish my coordinate system. And so then I can come down here and redraw 
my system on that coordinate system. So I've got my my shaft member here, and I've got points A, B, C, and D. So we've got those links that are given. We've got 500 millimeters, 400 millimeters, and 500 millimeters. And now I want to represent those torsions that we see in the isometric in a 2D sense using that sign convention. And just use your right hand. So 250 on the top, I twist my fingers in that direction. Where's my thumb pointing? To the left. So I can just say, okay, I've got a torsion there, and typically the approach to distinguish in a 2D sense between normal force and torsion is we just make it a double-headed arrow. So that signifies that that's a torsion force and magnitude 250 newton meters. So then we come to B. It's kind of maybe a little hard to see that arrow, but the arrow is coming up over the back end like this. I twist my fingers like that. My thumb is pointing in that positive x direction. So I've got a torsion here at B, double headed arrow, magnitude 75 newton meters. At C, same direction as C. Magnitude's different, so that is 325 newton meters. And then at D, torque supply in the opposite direction, so it is, whoops, 150 newton meters. So hopefully that sort of helps. So now what we want to do is section each region of our member to determine what the internal resultant is. So I'll give you a couple minutes to, to do that.
Last question. Um, that, is he talking about like just um, in the T Mac? Are you talking about the largest magnitude? So like, let's say let's say it was the time of question is negative two hundred fifty, right? And yep. Then, but then the highest positive was one hundred seventy five. Would we take still take that two hundred fifty, or would we do one hundred seventy five because that's positive? Yeah, it's uh, absolute value. Absolute value, not like a magnitude test. The, the positive negative just in, uh, is a sign convention that lets you know which way the shear stresses are directed, um, but we're just concerned about what that max value is. But good question. Yeah? This is kind of unrelated, but the difference would change in portion over the bar or beam or axle. Um, yeah. So that big, the biggest jump from 125 to make it 150. Does that change in torsion, uh, any sort of uh, mechanical properties in the worry about in the material? So the, uh, the observationally, what's happening in our member, if we start on this end and start going here we have positive torsion and so our member is twisting in this direction and so it's twisting quite a bit from A to B we get B to C it's twisting a little bit less and then when we get C to D it's twisting the opposite way so that angle of twist is that next comment uh, or topic that we're going to start to solve for. And so that is significant in when you move from positive to, ne to negative that is twisting from one direction to the other. But as far as the um, stresses in our material, when you're twisting from this way, and you start to that 325 newton meter torque is applied, it's going from trying to twist the material apart in this direction to trans, you know, we pass through this period of zero stress to then twisting it in the opposite direction, magnitude 150. So we have a, a net stress drop because this magnitude is 150 in the opposite direction, this stress is 175 in the positive direction. So even though this step is significant, it overall has a reduction in stress uh, on the molecular level. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, if you, if you actually get observation when you tell people, you'd be like, there's no funny with this part, it's not going to start twisting in the opposite direction, like it's a smooth. Yeah, that, that this, uh, if we were to look at the cross section throughout, we would see really big distortion here, slightly less here, and then, you know, change in direction here, but it would just be consistent in this region, consistent in this region, consistent in that region. So it just changes direction. Yeah. Bringing this slightly back to statics. Um, I remember how, for example, the shear stress um, graph, when it's integrated with certain like initial conditions, can give us bending moment. Um, is there some, some kind of relationship between torsion and maybe shear stress of a similar sort? Yes. Um, so in the derivation, if you look at uh, that, you'll see it, but what we have on our cross section is you know here at the middle we've got zero shear stress and our shear stress i'm going to show it at, at four points the cardinal directions uh, just just for clarity that um, shear stress in this region is going to vary like that once we get up to the top, shear stress 
you know, it's varying like that. Over here on this side, shear stress is varying like this. And down here, it's varying like that. So it's always just varying radially about the member. And so the direction of the shear stress varies constantly. Are you on the left side, the top side, the right side? Right now, where we're looking at problems that are purely torsion, only torsion is the only resultant, that's not significant because we're just really concerned about magnitude. But uh, your question as far as what is the relationship between shear stress and torsion, that uh, stress is equal to uh, force over area. And so we can look at a differential element there that the stress uh, tau is just going to be equal to that shear stress over that differential volume element. And if you then were to integrate that stress over the area and multiply by the radius rho, radius rho is going to be the distance from the center to that differential element, and then you integrate that whole thing over the cross section, that would be equal to your torsion. So the um, integral of shear stress times your radius dA over your area is equal to that torsional moment. If that, that, that answers your question or that general relationship. Okay. So then we solved that first one, calculated that max. Oh, did we? We didn't actually calc calculate, calculate it, it, did we? No. no, we talked about it. So, J. Here we go. Let's do this. What do we do with J? Yeah. How do we so, get so we're given shaft diameter 50 millimeters, and we need to determine C and J. So C is easy. C is the radius. <clears throat> so just D over 2. J, uh, this shaft diameter is solid, so we just have a solid circular cross section. So the equation we can look up in that cheat sheet is J is equal to pi over 2 times C to the fourth. So C is equal to radius, which is equal to 50 millimeters over 2, so that's 25 millimeters. J is equal to pi over 2 times C to the fourth. So pi over 2 times 25 millimeters raised to the fourth. So J is equal to 6.136 times 10 to the fifth millimeters to the fourth. So, we take all those values to plug into our equation, so tau max is equal to our torsional moment, 250 newton meters is our max, times our radius, 25 millimeters, over our j, 6.136 times 10 to the fifth, millimeters to the fourth. So if we look at our units, new meters times millimeters, we want to be consistent there. So if we were to convert this new meters to new millimeters, then we get newton millimeters squared on the numerator, millimeters to the fourth on the bottom, 
we'd end up with newtons per square millimeter, which is force over area stress. Um, stress. So uh, let's just multiply. Uh, we've got 1,000 millimeters per meter to do that conversion on the top. And then we will get our stress. Comes out to 10.2 newtons per millimeter squared. No, so it'd be totally fine. You can do this in newtons per millimeter squared. This could be in pascals. This could be in gigapascals. This could be kilonewtons per square millimeter. As long as it's units of stress, force over area, I'm happy. Um, I think you know the book generally defaults to well, let's make this somewhat user friendly as far as you know one decimal place type answer, and so it converts it to whatever units make it that. Um, and so if you do that, great, but for the exam scenario, if you just have force per area, whatever the units are, I'll, I'll count it. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry, what? Uh, we're converting this meters to millimeters. Yeah. So uh, we want to have millimeters on the numerator and meters on the bottom because then the meters and the meters can. Yeah. So that cancels with that. Okay, so we just got 10 minutes left. Let's, uh, let's see what our next topic is here. The angle twist, we've already started to, started to look at this. Let me start with the definition. All right, were those questions? Do you have questions? We're just tired of hearing me talk. I right, this one. I can appreciate that. Okay, so angle twist definition. Let me run through this. So angle twist is going to be a measure of the angular deformation formed in an object due to a torsional moment. Angular deformation. formed in an object due to a torsional moment. And just a comment on nomenclature, that torsional moment, you'll often see it reply or refer to as a torque. And so both terms are synonymous. You can interchange them. Due to a torque, due to a torsional moment, they're, they're just. So what our diagram is showing us here is that you know originally we've got our member. We can look at this longitudinal line drawn about its axis, and originally it's just like straight on our member. We apply a torsional force to it, and that line then is rotating angularly about our member. And so what we often are looking at is like this end of our member, you look at a, a cross-sectional point that initially is pointing straight up, due to that applied torque, it's then rotating over some angle, so that 
angle that it rotates through there, that's your angle of twist that we denote by phi. And so phi can come into play uh, in particular, you know, phi is not necessarily a, a big concern as far as shear stress. You know, shear stress is just a function of what is that torque and what is C and J that we just saw in the last one. But when you've got, you know, a long member, that distance that your member twists over that shaft length can be significant. And then in particular, if you've got a mesh, mesh gear sort of scenario where you've got other elements that are tying in there, that deformation over that shaft length is going to influence things that connect with it. And so that in particular is where we want to consider and look at well, what is this amount of twist, that amount of rotation that occurs over its length. So uh, this again, sort of the derivation relates directly to you know looking at that that element BD like we had in our first derivation, relating uh, two equations for it and rearranging terms to an integral. And at the end of the day, we come down here with this equation for the angle of phi is equal to. T times L over J times G. So these terms, T, that internal result in torsion, exactly the same as in the shear stress equation. We've got T, we've got length, length of the shaft, J, follow moment inertia that we just solved for. So G, this is a new term. Does anyone recall coming across this in maybe chapter? One or two? Shear modules. Shear modules. And so we didn't explicitly talk about this during our uh, chapter three where we're talking about stress strain scenarios, but uh, your typical stress strain graph that you know we were looking at like for you know A36 steel looks something like this. This is specifically you're taking an element you're applying normal force to it and measuring that delta L over L strain, plotting those values, and you get this. And we had the slope of this linear region being modulus of elasticity. Well, you can do the exact same thing for any material, and you plot shear stress over shear strain and just measure what that is, and, and you get often a, a very, very similar plot based on the material. So if it's a ductile steel material, you, you get that. And so that slope of that linear portion is just your shear modulus. <clears throat> so we can apply directly Hooke's law to shear scenarios that you know the stress is going to be equal to your uh, Shear modulus times strain, shear strain, etc. And so all those sort of normal force relationships we had are directly applicable to shear because we're just operating in that linear linear region. So that's just a, a material property. So we can look up in those those tables in your book. Here we are. So you've got right next to your shear modulus, or your modulus elasticity, you've got G, your shear modulus. You look up, you grab that. So that will be a, a, a standard that's known for your given problem. So similar to what we did with the normal force where often you're going to have regions of your member that are going to vary over the length. And so if you want to look at the change in the angle of twist over that whole length of your member, then we're just going to look at the summation. 
if the angle of twist in that first section plus angle of twist in the second plus angle of twist in the third is going to give you that total angle of twist change from beginning to end. So we've got that there. So we'll pick up on that on Thursday. Graph for um, pork and pork. Usually, is that like a normal thing? You mean this block? Yeah. So the values are going to be different. Oh, but no. the shape will be the same. Shape is more or less the same for the values. So this, oh, okay. this, this value here for a thirty six still would be thirty six psi, and so this value here. It's, it's going to be something different. Yeah. But the shape is basically the same. Okay, cool. Wait, what's this one again? That's shear strain. That's shear strain. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. The tape for all the Okay. Um, 89, so one, I guess, important observation with steel is that the modulus of elasticity and shear modulus are the same for uh, all your sort of ductile steels. E36, E992 um, are all going to be the same. So was that uh, what's problem? Uh, it's the second example. Then I think on one of the homework problems too. Okay. Mentioned that. Yeah. So, so just as far like, as the modulus and the shear modulus, that's going to be exactly the same as A36 for that material. Um, and that's all you're going to need. Got it. Just treat it the same. Yep. Um, where will the tutoring sessions be held? They're all in EV3. Okay, perfect. Um, I also want to know why you're wearing to watch. Oh, uh, I got get extra stuff for somebody. Uh, so I, I got a new one uh, at Christmas that I've been trying out, but I, you know, these are all like big data things, right? It's yeah. like, well, I don't want to lose this data yet until I'm sure I want to keep this one. So, uh, so it's kind of a pain. I need to figure out which one I want to keep and then get rid of it. But I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind, of, I'm kind of a fitness, fitness junkie, so I like to like run a bike in and try to come out. Um, I have yeah. accommodations for.